guys. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. That just is so powerful and so majestic. We were, uh, Pastor Tanya and I were on the way yesterday to Meridian to her father's 85th birthday. And as we were going up through past Wiggins, up through there somewhere, Tanya said, uh, said let's, let's agree together for uh, our family. And, and then we started naming each one as we were going, calling their name and naming what it was that we had either concern about or we wanted to expand or, or in some way it was about their particular life. And I think we probably made it all the way, we went all the way into Hattiesburg. I mean, it ended up being everybody. <laughs> it was everybody, including ourselves. And uh, I, I was just happy to think of that when Tanya said, you know, is there someone that you need to pray and, and, and maybe break a stronghold or an addiction or you need the Lord to work in their life. And the, the, the name of Jesus is a powerful, powerful name and a powerful tool that God tells us to speak that name. There is no name that is above that name. That name is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, everything, everyone would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, anyway, we're on uh, our Experience in God series, and uh, I've, we've spent two, uh, two messages on this, and we've gone through the four realities. Now, let me just say this to you today. The two, and I hate to use this term, but if you want to, the two most vital aspects to experiencing God happen today. They are the fifth and the sixth reality. Without these, uh, you can ha I mean, hearing God speak to you is an experience with God. Uh, through the word, uh, through prayer, through a Christian friend, through the church, through a message, uh, all of those are experiences with God. But, but the coming to know God by experience as he accomplishes his work through you only happens if, if you complete Reality five and reality six. I mean, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is, this is what creates uh, your use or you, know, you just have a, a, a minimum experience of, of uh, hearing God and, and then you don't obey and it just doesn't go any further than that. Uh, and it's really what, what the Bible calls that is disobedience, really. And Jesus rebuked his disciples over and over and over for their lack of belief and disobedience. So anyway, let's move on with this, all right? Let me, get, let, let me just start where we were. First, uh, reality number one, God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that is real and, per, and personal. This is why we were created. God created us because he wanted to have a personal love relationship with us. That's why we are here. Uh, and, and, it, and he desires for it to be real. It's not some cosmic experience. It's not some idea or philosophy. It is a real experience, and it is personal. It's not just corporate. Like, for God so loved the world. Well, we know that. that God loves everybody in the world. That's corporate. God loves you personally. That's what God wants you to understand. And that if there had only been one person on the, in this world and you were it, he would have still died for you because he wants his love relationship with us not to just be with the church or with the kingdom, but with you personally. It is a personal relationship with you. Second, God is always at work around you. This is true. God has always been at work. There's never been a time where God was not working in this universe. In the beginning, God created is the first verse of the Bible. Before creation, God was working. God is working now. God will continue to work all the way through the final judgment and then into heaven and eternity with us. So God is always working around us. There's never a time where we can see God and he's not up to his work in, 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 in this world. Reality number three is God invites you to join him in his work because God loves you. God invites you to come to work with him. 
The reason why he involves you is because he wants this to extend his personal relationship with you. So the more you're around him and the more you see God's work, the more you're drawn to love God in a deeper way and have a deeper personal relationship with him. So God invites you to join him in what he's doing. And then the fourth last week was God speaks to us. How, do we, how does he invite us? He's, a bird flies in the window or a voice booms out of heaven or, or how, what does he, how does he invite us? Well, he could do anything, but in these last days, in, since the book of Acts, the Lord has chosen primarily four ways that he speaks to us. God speaks to us by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. He reveals himself so that our, we will have faith to believe that what God has called us to can be accomplished by him. We need to know his purposes so that we will know what God is wanting to do with us and what he's inviting us to. And then we need to know his ways so that we can cooperate with what God does. The purpose of God was to save the entire world and that no soul would be lost. The way God did it was by sending Jesus to the cross to die for all of us. So sometimes the ways of God may seem harsh or maybe even barbaric or uh, non-understandable at times. Why did God do this? It was to accomplish his purpose. And the only way his purpose could be accomplished is by doing the work in God's ways. So God invites us. The fifth reality, and this is the first opportunity for the rubber to hit the road, so to speak, and it is this. God's invitation for you to work with him always leads to a crisis of belief. Everybody say a decision that requires two things, faith and action. Faith is the essential element in which any dealings with God occurs. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says about it in Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith... It is impossible to please him. For he who comes to him must believe that he is. Is what? That he is present, that he is involved, that he is active, that it matters to him. He that comes to God by faith must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That God exists, that God is involved, that God is personal, that God wants to be involved, that it matters to him what happens in your personal situation and in the personal situation of everybody in this world, and that he will reward us if we will diligently, constantly, aggressively, with passion, obey him in what he says to us. So faith is absolutely necessary in any relationship and in any response to God. And it's critical that we believe this because when God invites us to come to work with him, it always involves a God-sized project. Now, don't get overwhelmed by this. I didn't say that it involved uh, saving the world, becoming president of the United States, starting a large corporation, or inventing a country, which is what we think of when we hear the word God-sized. All that simply means is God invites us to a work that can only be done by him, that without his involvement in it, it just cannot be done. And I'll just remind you that if God is concerned about it, it's not a small thing. 
even if it might seem like a very limited thing, like the salvation of one of your family members or the encouragement of a friend who needs their faith encouraged and they're going through a tough time or somebody needs some support or somebody needs some resources or even these small personal things are not small because God is concerned. And God is, anything God is concerned about is not small. And God invites us to work with him in things that can't be done without him, things that he has to be involved in. I'll give you an example, and I said I was going to talk about this, and I'm just going to do it for just a second. Uh, and I just use this big example because we all know about it. Uh, at, with Katrina, uh, do you know that happened about just about exactly uh, 16 and a half years ago? Does it seem like that long? Yeah, it was in September, right, of 2005. We woke up on a Monday morning, Pastor Tanya and I, at 5.30 in the morning when our power went off. The wind was blowing. You could hear it just sounded like a jet engine out there. And then it had that high whistle in it. I said it sounded like a cricket riding a turbine. You know, it was just like, you know, and it had that high. And every once in a while it would go, and the, and, the, and the two by fours would go, and I'm thinking, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. I'm seeing Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> no place like home. But anyway, after it was over, 12 hours later, after it was over, we took a sledgehammer to get out the door of the house because the door had been warped. It was wood. It had been blown so much it, it had to knock our way out. And, um, and we went to, everywhere you went, no, I, I don't know that there was a telephone pole in the whole Gulf Coast standing. Uh, lines down, uh, trees, uh, everything. We might finally made it to church a week later. A week later, we finally cut our way, others cut their way, trees were moved, poles were moved, power, all that dangerous stuff. Enough, we could get to the church that we were pastoring. Uh, we drove up on the, on the driveway, and uh, there were a few people there that had made their way there that had lost their homes, lost everything. And uh, that, and that Sunday morning, of course, the church had no power or anything like that. We had to leave the doors open so we could even see in there. And uh, uh, about 45 or, uh, or so of us gathered at a, on an altar where we could see. And we started worshiping the Lord and started uh, speaking faith and, and, and encouraging each other in what we could do and so forth. And at about that time, a truck rolled up outside that door a little bob truck, the back went up like that. It was full of supplies, materials, all that kind of stuff. Some guys came in the service, sat down, started worshiping with us and praising with us. And, and, um, and at the end, when it was all over, they said, hey, listen, uh, we, uh, are, we represent merchants from Spanish Fort, Alabama, and we have collected this truck full of supplies and materials. And they said, come over here and find somebody that's doing something to help people and give it to them. So it looks like y'all are doing something to help people. Do you want these supplies? Now, at that moment, I know this doesn't sound like it, but at that moment, that was a crisis of belief. God had spoken through prayer, had spoken through other Christians, had spoken through circumstances, everything blown up, torn up, here we were in the middle of disaster, and now God sends some relief, and he says, are you going to believe me enough to trust that I can do this? Are you going to join me in what I'm doing? I said, let's unload it. And we started unloading it for the next two years. We never, I mean, the sanctuary was full of supplies. People were coming from everywhere. That afternoon, just to give you one more example, and I'm moving on now because I could talk about this all, all day. This is so exciting because it, it's just alive. Any, anytime you experience God in these ways, it's just as real 50 years later as it was the day it happened. And, and that afternoon I, I, at dark, I finally made it back home, and I was walking down my driveway to dragging some some of what used to be my fence down to the road to pile it up in this giant pile. And, and I got to the end of the driveway and I had my phone in my back pocket, a little flip phone back then. And um, Century uh, Cellular South was what the company was back then. They gave us some phones to use. They said, looks like you guys are doing something here. We're going to give you four or five phones, cell phones to use. And just use them until, you know, all this is over. 
and we did, and I still have the same telephone number, by the way, but, but uh, I flipped, I, I, it started ringing, and I flipped it, and I answered, and the voice on the other end said to me, uh, hi, I'm uh, Eddie, and, and he said his whole name, so I'm Eddie, uh, I am the, uh, the, the, the uh, president or the, the leader of the North Carolina Baptist Men's uh, Disaster Recovery Group. And we would like to know if you would like for us to come and set up on the parking lot of your church and, and help in the recovery. Because we, we can't just come down there with nowhere to go uh, and we need to be invited. So can we, do you, would you like for us to come down there? That moment, a crisis of belief. Do you have enough faith to believe that what I have said to you, I know you can't do it. I know you don't have enough resources and you're not powerful enough to affect a whole city, a whole area. Do you believe that I can use you to do this? I said, bring it on down. A day and a half later, they're sitting up on the parking lot. First meal, first meal, served three meals a day for a year and a half almost. First meal, 14,538 people were fed. Ambulances backed up and took meals out to areas that couldn't make it in because bridges were out or, or trees or whatever, and people were there that had nothing to eat and no food. For a year and a half, that happened. Anytime God speaks to you and invites you to join him, you are always led to a crisis of belief that requires faith. And true faith requires action. The first thing I want to say about that faith and action is when God speaks, your response requires faith. Let me go back to verse 1 of Hebrews 11. I read verse 6. Here's verse 1. Now faith is the substance, the foundation. I've talked about this many times. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is what your hope stands on. Faith is the substance. That's literally what the word means. It means a foundation to stand on. The, the Greek word means a foundation to stand on. So your hope has to have something to stand on or it will not survive. And it is the evidence. What is the evidence? The proof that what we believe is really true. So faith is what it takes to have something to stand on and to have to believe that whatever it is that God has said to you is really going to happen. Now, one of the shortest verses in the Bible, besides Jesus wept, is 2 Corinthians 5, 7. By the way, most people, if you ask them on the street, what's your favorite verse? Uh, uh, Jesus wept. You know, they, because they can remember that one. Here's 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith and not by sight. So faith then is the confidence that what God said or what God promised that God is actually going to see come to pass. Sight, on the other hand, would be the opposite motivator from faith. Sight says, I can see it. I can see the accomplishment of it. And I'm just going to say this. If you can, if you can see the accomplishments, accomplishment of it, most of the time, it's not going to require any faith to be accomplished. Because faith says, the God who has called me to this assignment is the one who will provide for the accomplishment of this assignment. We have a cute little phrase we say. Uh, I certainly didn't invent it, but I've used it all the time. And the phrase is provision for the vision. God gives, if God has a vision he's called you to, a work he's called you to, he's going to provide for the vision for the work that he has called you to. And he still does it every day today. Now, second little observation about faith and, and work. Your faith must be in a person. Your faith does not rest in a concept. 
It does not rest in an idea. Your faith rests in a person, God himself. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 2. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I mean, don't, don't forget, when God speaks to you, God always reveals what he is going to do. He's not revealing what he wants you to do for him. He's revealing what he's already working in, and then he's inviting you to join him in what he's doing. And I'm going to tell you, only he can accomplish it. Accomplish it. Moses could not deliver the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage. Moses could not part the Red Sea and let the Israelites walk through on dry ground. Moses could not call water from a rock. Moses could not produce manna from heaven. Only God can do that. Joshua could not lead Israel across the Jordan River on dry ground. He could not accomplish the defeat of gigantic walled cities like Jericho. He could not stop the sun in the middle of a battle so that the battle could be won. Only God could do that. The disciples on their own could not feed the multitudes. They could not heal the sick. They could not calm the storm. They could not raise the dead. They could only do that through the power of God. So when God lets you know what he wants to do through you, it will be something that only God can do. Let me give you another example. 14 and a half years ago, just about exactly 14 and a half years ago, God, for lack of a better word, blew us out of our comfort zone rudely, might I might add. Uh, you don't want this to happen to you, is what I'm saying. And we were at a crisis of belief. What did God want? What was God doing? Did we need to go somewhere and pastor somewhere else? Was our mission here in, in, this, in this city, our journey? And, and, and myself and my son, Justin, my ex-son-in-law, Jason, and a young man that we call DR went up to our fellowship hall, what has become our fellowship hall, the, De the big Biloxi campground in DeSoto National Forest. And we camped out overnight. And we sat there through the night talking to each other about what our feelings were and what, what our hearts were. Everybody say, the church. The Holy Speaks, the, the Lord speaks to us through, by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church, other Christians about what God would have us to do. Did God want us to start a work? Did God want us to leave the area? Did, what, what did God, do we need to quit the ministry? What is, what is it that we need to do? And we sat there and around that campfire and we, we prayed together and by prayer, I mean, we entered into prayerful conversation and allowed the Spirit of God to speak. You know, sometimes, you know, prayer is a two-way communication is what prayer is. Prayer is not getting down on your knees and having some religious experience. Prayer is saying God to God some things and then letting him say some stuff back to you. Well, sometimes God has to use other human voices to say something back to you. And he did that. And we sat there and we, and, and, and the question was, what do we do? Because God had given us a word from the Bible that word that we speak every Sunday morning, Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, the Lord had given about four or five of us an inspiration to read that verse the same night, well, early in the morning. We weren't sleeping much back then. 
and it was probably two or three in the morning, and we called each other before the sun came up and said, did God, did God say anything to you? Did God give you a word of any kind? And I think it was Bev said, uh, Isaiah 43 last night. I just, I don't even know what it's about. I just said, God, I just felt like he wanted me to turn there. I said, well, that's funny because I did too. And then uh, I don't know if it was DR or just who it might have been, but somebody else said, hey, you know, God, yeah, that's the verse. And it's that verse, but forget all that. It's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I'm about to do a brand new thing. God speaks to us by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself and his purposes and his ways. And, and we came and, we, and we, we talked about that verse and we quoted that verse. And, and w- when we came back home that morning, we came around the little corner where I live, we, Tanya and I live, and our front yard was filled with tiny plastic farm animals like sheep and cattle and goats and horses and chickens. and I mean, just, you know, they were big enough. I mean, they weren't like little tiny miniature. They were big enough to see, but they were all scattered all over the yard, like stuck in the ground. Some, some sign company had come put them there, and it had a big sign that said, and it was from, it was from some people that wanted uh, to come with us in a church and blah, so forth. And it said, it on a sign, it said, um, we, your flock needs you. We are dumb sheep. We need our shepherd. Everybody say circumstances. The Holy Spirit speaks to us through the Bible. But forget all that. It's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. Get over it. Prayer. Personal communication with God. Circumstances. A yard full of signs that said, we need you. Your sheep needs you. We need our shepherd. And the church to reveal himself as purpose. At that point, there's a crisis of belief. A decision has to be made. Am I going to believe that God is powerful enough to do what he's calling us to be involved with him? Keep in mind, no uh, equipment, no equipment, no building, uh, no resources, no people, no church building, uh, no money. Do you, are you going to believe God? Uh, let me just tell you this. Before we had our first church service in, in, in my house, we baptized, was it 16 people? 17 people we baptized in the river up at our fellowship hall before we ever had one meeting of the church. A crisis of belief that requires faith. Are you going to believe me? But it also requires action. Here's the classic verse concerning faith and action. This verse, these words were said three times in the same chapter in the book of James chapter 2. And I'm just going to have here for you the 26th verse, but it says the same thing in the two before. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. It doesn't matter how much you believe or how fervently or how passionately you believe. If you don't do something, that's lack of, that's that's disobedience is what it is. Because faith is dead without works. Sub point A, what you believe about God will determine what you do. If you have faith in the God who has called you, you will obey him and he will bring it to pass and he will accomplish through you his purposes. 
if you lack faith, then you will not do what he wants. And of course, as I've mentioned, this is disobedience. Jesus frequently rebuked his disciples for their lack of faith and their unbelief. And their unbelief revealed that even though they had walked with him for three and a half years, they really did not know him and they did not know what he could do. Because what you believe about God determines what you do. Flip it around, and this is more than just word salad. Flip it around. B, what you do reveals what you believe about God. What you believe determines what you do. What you do reveals, it exposes, it shines out what you believe about God. Regardless of what you say, what you do reveals what you believe about God. When God reveals what he's purposed to do in you, through your life and in your life, it always leads you to a crisis of belief, a decision time where God, who already knows and sees everything, the world, and one more, the devil, gets to see what you really believe about God by what you do, because it reveals what you believe. Two blind men were on the road, and Jesus and a whole crowd were walking down the road. And the two men cried out, uh, Jesus Thou son of David, have mercy on us. It revealed that they believed that Jesus was merciful and that they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the son of David. And what did Jesus say to them? Be healed. Your faith has made you whole. They revealed what they believed. There was a Syrophoenician woman that had an issue of blood. And Jesus was crowded by so many people that she couldn't even get close to him. They were packed in everywhere. She crawls on her stomach, on the ground, through those people that would have been highly critical of her and condemning of her. And because she believed that if she could just touch the hem of his garment, that she could be made whole of whatever the infirmity was. And she crawled on her stomach through the people touched the bottom of his garment, and Jesus said, wait, whoa, who touched me? And the disciples said, man, everybody's touching you, Jesus. We're all packed in on you like a bunch of sardines. What do you mean, who touched you? He said, no, I felt virtue leave from me. Somebody touched me with faith, is what he said. And she was healed. It revealed, what she did revealed what she believed about God and what he would do. Jesus was asleep on the front of the boat. A gigantic storm blows up. The disciples are, all, are frantic. They run up there and they wake up Jesus and they said, Jesus, don't you care that we are perishing? And I thought to myself, how many times do we, I mean, we're real critical of disciples about doing that. But how many times do we respond the same way as if God didn't exist at all or he doesn't care what's happening in our life? God, don't you care that we're perishing? Up? And Jesus said, oh, you of little faith. Why are you so fearful? Now, if you read Matthew 8, you'll find out that he wasn't rebuking them because as human beings, they were filled with fear of the ocean overtaking them. He rebuked them because they didn't recognize his presence and his power and his purpose, even though they walked with him all that time. Just say the word, the, 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 uh, the centurion said, and my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, what'd you say? He said, look, I'm a man under authority. I work for the Roman government. I'm a soldier. I have, I'm, I'm, I'm responsible to some above me, and I'm over those below me. And I understand that when you are in authority, that the ones under you, you don't have to go do it. You just tell them, and it'll be done. And you don't even have to go over there. You just tell them, send an order, and it's done. And since you're the son of God, 
and you have authority over sickness and death and everything else, I'm just saying, you don't have to go over there. All you have to do is just say it, and, 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 and it has to obey. And Jesus said, man, I hadn't said, I like it. Jesus said, I like that. Uh, I hadn't heard that kind of faith in all of Israel. What you do, what each of these people did in each of these situations indicated to Jesus what kind of faith they had. Because what I believe about God affects what I do and how I live my life. And when God speaks to me and invites me to come to work with him, it always leads me to a crisis of belief. And that's the rubber meeting the road. That is the first crossroad that determines whether you go on with God to accomplish the purpose that God has called you to in life. Here's the second one, reality number six. You must make major adjustments to join God in what he is doing. Luke 9, 23, the classic verse, Jesus said, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, if anyone desires to be my disciple, what you're going to have to do, Jesus? Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. One of the biggest problems we have in experiencing God in our lives is that we want God to speak to us and give us an assignment, but we are not interested in making any major adjustments in our life. You can't go on with God and stay where you are at the same time. To go with God takes major adjustments in your life. And you may be saying, what kind of adjustments are we talking about, Pastor? Well, I'm, I'm going to put six. Uh, nay, put six. Here's, here's six. here's six things. These are just examples. I mean, but you may have to adjust your thinking. Yeah. You know, you have prejudices. And I'm not talking about racial prejudices. I'm talking about you have beliefs about certain things in certain ways that are wrong. And you're going to have to say, you know, that's ridiculous. That's not right. And you're going to have to forsake that kind of thinking. Or it may be methods of doing things. That, that you were trained up by your family to do certain things in certain ways, and it's wrong. And it won't work, and it's not right. you got to change that to go on with God. A major adjustment. And, and, and life goals, ideas, desires, all that. Or, or it may be circumstances. Your job. Do you know that for th almost 30 years of my life, in ministry, that I did not have any job but the ministry itself. That I went to work every day by going to my office or going to visit the hospital or going to visit a church member or uh, doing something in connection with, with my job at the church. And I studied and I had counseling sessions and I, and I went to meetings and all that and that's all I did. But when God spoke to me about Freedom River Church, remember, no people, no money, no resources, no building, no equipment, no nothing. I had to make major adjustments. I had to get a job. I'm still making major adjustments. I'm driving around 72 elementary kids and 45 high school kids twice a day every day, driving me crazy or crazier. Why? I had to make major adjustments. I had to change my thinking and my circumstances about how I lived my life. Uh, John just opened a business. I get, you ask John what kind of major adjustments have to be made, or Kathy, his wife. I, I, we pray that business is going to be so successful, John. We love it. It's awesome. Mac, I, heart mac. I heart mac and cheese. If you, ever, if you get a chance, come to Gulfport, go to I heart mac and cheese. It's a winner. It's a winner. That's a major adjustment. See, what, that, that's what I'm talking about. When God invites you, you may have to make some major adjustments. Relationships, your family, your friends, uh, 
Lots of people are involved when you make decisions and choices. You, it, it involves a lot of other people besides you. Uh, commitments to your church, to your family, to your job, the way you do things, actions, how you pray, how you give, how you serve, or even beliefs, what you believe about God, what you believe about his purposes, what you believe about his ways, what you believe about your relationship to him. All of those major, major, major adjustments. Those are all major adjustments in life, and you cannot stay where you are in some of those, if they're not godly, if they're not progressive, if they're not with God, you can't stay in them and go on with God at the same time. We say that Jesus is Lord of our life and that he has the authority to interrupt our life anytime he wants to. The only trouble is we don't ever expect him to do that. We expect him to come to us and affirm what we're already doing and to encourage us that we don't have to change anything about any way we go about doing anything. Does God ever ask a person to change his plans or her plans or directions in order to follow him? Well, if you read the scripture on every page, <laughs> you'll read God has enormous changes in the people that he used. For some of them, they had to leave their family, leave their whole country, leave their riches, leave their possession, leave their people. Others had to drop prejudices about other people like Jonah, who wouldn't go to Nineveh because he hated Ninevites. And he said, God, if I go down there, I know you, I know how soft you are. And if I go down there and I preach to them, they're going to repent, and then you're going to let them off the hook. So I'm not going, God. God said, well, uh, I got a little persuasion for you here. And then Jonah gets to take the first air condition, all air conditioned submarine ride. And God spits him out upon the bank and says, all right, uh, you going to Nineveh? <laughs> he says, which way is it? And he goes and preaches, and the whole city gets saved, just like he thought. But he had to change his prejudice about Ninevites before he could be used by God and walk with God. Others had to leave behind life goals, uh, jobs. I mean, all the disciples were something else before they were disciples. None of them were professional clergymen. And Jesus said, hey, come with me, and I'll take you to a better church. No, they were fishermen and tax collectors and businessmen and all of that. And they had to leave their whole careers and life goals and everything else in order to follow Jesus. Sure, man, Jesus did that. I'm going to read you a testimony. Do I have time? Yeah. All right, I'm going to just read it because I don't want to elaborate on it. I just want to read, you, read it to you because it illustrates this thing of major adjustments now. This is a testimony from our son in the ministry, Buddy Ramey. And most of you know Bud. He's been here he, he, went, he graduated from Mississippi uh, Gulf Coast Community College with a degree in processing while living at our house and coming here, and he played the guitar for us, and he did all, I mean, you guys know, bud. All right, I asked him, I said, bud, uh, write down your testimony so I can read it, uh, because it's a, it's, it's a classic picture of major adjustments. Let me, let me read this to you. At the, all right, he got called by the Lord at, when he was a teenager. He felt like God was calling him to the ministry that God wanted him to work in the ministry, in the church, with music. All right, at age, at age 20, I felt led by the Lord to get back in college and pursue a degree in music. After all, I had surrendered in my heart to obey God's desire to use me in his ministry, and education is important in most ministry fields. So I hitchhiked from Meridian to Hattiesburg to attend the University of Southern Mississippi. By chance, he's got God providing, yeah, no, no chances with God. By chance, a friend who was commuting to William Carey College, which also is in Hasburg, picked me up just as I started walking. Coincidence? <laughs> I think not. All right, the guy, he's walking from Meridian to Hattiesburg because he feels like God wants him to go to school at USM, get his degree in music. By uh, uh, he dropped me at, US, at the USM campus where I knew only one person. I had a friend that attended and took a chance that he might be helpful. I waited at the Baptist Student Union building until I ran into him. 
Imagine that. Got it, just sitting there waiting for the guy. Hopefully, he'll come by sometime. With kindness, he allowed me to stay with him for a few weeks. Knowing I needed a job, I started walking to various businesses, putting in applications, and McDonald's on Highway 49 hired me that day. I lived about a mile from the restaurant so I could walk to work every day. I worked maintenance at night by myself. To have something to eat, after all the employees left, I would go to the dumpster and dig, dig food from the garbage bags. The food was unsold leftovers, so it was clean. The only issue was that I had to get there before the cats, or there would have been a terrible fight for territory and dominance and Big Macs. After a few weeks, my friend told me that it was time for me to move on, to move out. So that day I heard about some guys who were looking for a roommate. I took the apartment. A few weeks later, I got into an altercation with my boss at McDonald's and quit the job. I walked up the road to the Ramada Inn and got a job as a dishwasher in the restaurant. Thankfully, the restaurant was again only about a mile from my apartment. The job was a blessing because they allowed employees to eat one meal per shift. The cook and I became friends, and she always made sure I had enough to eat and maybe a little more to take home. After struggling for over a year, never able to enroll at USM, I was, I was getting frustrated. I decided to move back home to Meridian. A church in Meridian contacted me via my mother and asked me if I would consider a position as music director. I bought a Volkswagen for $600 from money I'd saved and with help from my mother, and I started school at Meridian Community College and took the music position at the church. That was 8th Avenue, by the way. Obeying God's voice and adjusting your life to him is a major crossroad in being used by him. It was during this time of adjustment, listen to this, it was during this time of adjustment I learned from experience that where God leads, he provides and cares for his children. Now, I just read you his story. How many of us would be laying in a ditch somewhere squalling that God wasn't taking care of us? We had to go eat out of a dumpster to get something to eat. He said, I learned during this adjustment that from experience that where God leads, he provides and cares for his children. I was homeless, but always had a roof over my head. I was hungry, but was always fed. I was desperate but never in desperation. I was broke, but never went without basic necessities. It, it's really been like that my whole life, he says. God has always, without exception, provided. Stepping out on nothing but faith is not easy, but it's not on us to do anything but be faithful and be obedient. By the way, he did graduate from USM with a degree in music, even though he had to take algebra, college algebra, three times. And I really don't think he ever really passed it. I, I think they just felt sorry for him and said, okay, that's the only thing you lack. Let's get you out of here. But, but hear this. He also graduated later in life from Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College with a degree in processing, which requires multitudes of math. And he was actually a tutor in college algebra at MCCCCCCC. <laughs> Once the adjustments are made, God accomplishes his purposes through, the, through those that he calls. You cannot stay where you are and go with God. Obedience requires total dependence on God to work through you. It's not something you can do. And without him, it can't be done. Which leads me to reality seven, and here it is. You come to know God by experience as you obey him, and he accomplishes his work through you. You come to know God by sitting in a sanctuary singing about him. You come to know God by reading stories about him. You come to know God by hearing other people talk about their experiences with him? No, you come to know God as you obey him and he accomplishes his work through you. You come to know him. 
John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. If any man <laughs> obeys my word, then I'm going to come in, my father's going to come in, and we're going to set up home in you. After God has taken the initiative to involve you in his work, you believe him, you adjust your life to him, only then do you come to the place of obedience. You can't, you can't come to obedience if you, haven't, if you haven't heard his call, if you haven't believed him, and if you haven't made any adjustments. You're not in the position to obey. You, you must do all of those, and then, and only then, do you even get in the position to obey him. And I've got three observations real quick, and I promise they'll be quick. I realize I'm running out of time. All right, here's your sign. When, when we hear God invite us to join him, we often want a sign. We want an affirmation. We, won't, we, we look at the Lord and we say, Lord, prove to me that this is you. And if you prove to me this is you, then I'll do what you say. All right. When Moses stood before the burning bush, Moses wanted God to give him a sign, an affirmation. And Moses really basically asked God for a sign. And God told Moses, all right, I'm going to give you a sign. And I want to read those, the, the two verses that he says this in. This is in Exodus 3, verse 11, 12. Moses is unsure now, and he's going to God, and he's saying, God, are you sure you want to use me? Give me a sign. Moses, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel? God, are you sure you want to use me? Who am I? I'm a nobody. You got the wrong man, God. Come on, you got you to show me something before. The, I can't believe you'd want to use somebody. And then here's what God said, verse 12. So he said, God said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. Notice what he says. The sign is, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. In other words, Moses, you obey me. I will deliver Israel through you. You will come to know me by experience as you obey me. And when you get finished, you'll come back up on this mountain and you'll worship me and you will know that I sent you. In other words, you obey me first and then you get the affirmation. You don't get the affirmation first and then obey. You, get, you obey and then you get the affirmation. The affirmation always comes after uh, the obedience. And this is true all the way throughout any stories you read in the Bible. This is just the way it happens. Second little observation, God does not give up on you. You may be wondering if I disobey God, or we should say when I disobey God, um, do, is he going to give me another chance? Well, I'm encouraged to say to you that many times God does give another chance. The only thing I can say is there's no guarantee of that. Sometimes God doesn't give, but many times God does, like he did to Jonah, as an example that I talked about a moment ago about going to Nineveh. And, and after a little whale incident or a little great fish incident, uh, that was, he got another chance. And he went and he obeyed, and then God did what he wanted in him. And uh, Jonah experienced God and got confirmation from God when he obeyed. All right. Third observation. The reason God does not give up on you is because God is not looking for a reason to condemn you. God is looking for an opportunity to develop your character to create a better you, to create a stronger you. He's not looking for an opportunity to put the hammer on you. He's looking for an opportunity to bless you and to grow you. In your relationship with God, 
you have the choice of what decision you make. God has given us free choice, free will. Even when we're saved, we have the opportunity to make any decision we want to make. Sometimes we make the wrong decision. When we make the wrong decision, the Holy Spirit that is within us begins to move in us to convince us that the decision that we made is not the will of God. When we hear the Holy Spirit and he convinces us that this is not the will of God, then we repent, which means we turn away from our decision, and we go toward God. And sometimes God even uses the consequences of these poor choices to actually create something beneficial in our life. Uh, that's what Romans 8, 28 is all about. For we know that all things work together for good. All things. Bad choices? Well, yeah, God takes those and makes something good when he works it together with everything else. And you learn a lesson and you grow up. And, and he does this because he loves you and he wants the very best for you. And that's why he gives you commands and instructions because he wants you to walk through life without hurt and complications and error, and, and he wants the best for you. I mean, his commands are not to limit us. His commands are to give us the best possible life that we could ever have. I mean, you parents know what this is talking about. You do the same thing with your children. Your children look at you and say, you're so mean. You, you, you know, why, why do I, other kids get to do it and I don't? And, you know, and, and you're, you're, you're just, you just want to punish me. I mean, they just make all kinds of charges, right? What's your motivation? Your motivation is, I want you to grow up and be a responsible adult. I want you to have a good life. I want you to be able to make some money and have a family and enjoy life and, and be a capable, responsible person. That's why I discipline you. That's why I have these demands of you. Not to harm you, but to help you. That's God, and that's us. That's why the Scripture says He is our Heavenly Father, and we are His children. That's not by accident, by the way. That analogy is on purpose. All right, there they are the seven realities, the seven hooks to hang your experience on with God. They're just concepts where you can see God working in your life. God works all the time in our life, guys, if we just open our eyes to see them. And this is how you see them. Uh, next time something happens, you go, oh, man, that was just, oh, what a coincidence. Think, uh-oh, I just missed something with God. All right, let me back up here and see if I can get something. All right, let's bow our heads.